Welcome to the Knife Junkie Podcast, your weekly dose of knife news and information about knives and knife collecting. Here's your host, Bob the Knife Junkie DeMarco. Welcome to the Knife Junkie Podcast. I'm Bob DeMarco. On this edition of the show, I'm speaking with David Cam of Orion Knives. David's love of EDC gear, uh, especially folding knives, led him to become a very active player in the knife community with his Blade Banter YouTube channel, his Apex Pass Around group, and ultimately with his knife designs and company. His first knife, the Solaris, came out to much well-deserved fanfare as a beefy, stylish, fidgety EDC built around a very well-tuned button lock flipper, something that was quite unique at that time. David uh, has a new knife out built around that same awesome action called the Scorpio, a cool little clip point and micarta charmer. Uh, plus, Orion's got another totally different prototype uh, called the Cetus now in the works. I have it in my hot little hands and uh, we'll check that out. Uh, we'll catch up with David and a lot more from Orion Knives. But first, be sure to like, comment, subscribe and hit the notification bell and download the show to your favorite podcast app. And as always, if you want to help support the show, uh, the Knife Junkie podcast here, you can go to Patreon. The quickest way to get there is to head over to thenifejunkie.com slash Patreon. Ever visit the knives online in the hopes of satisfying your need to possess them in the real world? Then you have a problem. You are a knife junkie. Hello, David. Welcome back to the show, sir. How's it going, guys? Thanks for having me back. Oh, it's my pleasure. My pleasure. Well, like I mentioned up front, um, uh, I've had a chance. You you sent me these two knives to check out, and I greatly appreciate it. Uh, the Scorpio um, and the Cetus. We'll look at the Cetus a little while later. But this is this is your newer knife uh, release, and I want to congratulate you on this. You have uh, you've really um, uh, taken and and run with the success of the Solaris and given us something. Uh, similar but very different and uh, really cool. Yeah, I think so because then it's just kind of a uh, iteration or kind of just kind of locking things down a little bit more because then I, that one has just a little bit more uh, things like uh, the crown line and there's the fuller on it, uh, so it kind of just takes up a notch from uh, the Ryan side because uh, for the knife side, at least for me, I don't intend to have uh, like 10,000 different models out there. Uh, I want to kind of treat it more like a car company. Uh, so that's where I want to have things that meet uh, different uh, different purposes and then kind of stay with that because a, a Corolla uh, from 1980s does not look like a Corolla from uh, 2022. Uh, so that's kind of uh, where I'm going to be sticking with that and kind of sticking with the name. So if you like the, the Solaris, the Scorpio, uh, Cetus, uh, then those are going to be kind of names that will stick with, um, at least that's the plan. Uh, that's actually a very interesting concept. And, and to compare it to a car company um, who, you know, like the vet, the Corvette, it's been around for a long time and it's looked very different in, in its major iterations, but each time it's awesome. Oh, and, yeah. and uh, so to, to, to do that with, with these knives, I think that's a, it's a really cool idea. I mean, we, uh, with designers such as yourself, it, it seems like, or, or companies in general, it seems like you can go two ways. And we talk about that on the show a bit, you know, you can go the tops route and have 50 million models, all yeah. awesome, all available at once. But that seems to take an incredible amount of bandwidth or something, or you could be more like a Chris Reeve knives and have a couple of models that you like year after year dial in over and over. Yeah, definitely a good comparison there. And that's probably more so the route that I want to go in as far as more Chris Reeve style uh, instead of uh, the top side. I mean, they do a great job with it. Uh, they still do OEM work as well. So uh, eventually, maybe if I do a fixed plate, maybe I'll uh, team up with them. Oh, yeah, I love I love tops. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about uh, the your use of the button lock flipper. Um, I mentioned up front uh, in in the intro that when the Solaris came out just a couple of years ago, um, a well-tuned uh, button lock flipper was a rarity. I think maybe the ProTech, I know the Mordax had been out at, at that point. I'm not sure about the Malibu. Uh, but other than that, we, we hadn't seen this influx like we see now. Uh, with our some of our favorite brands, um, what what keyed you into the button lock, and what were your some of your challenges making making the flipper mechanism work with a button lock? 
Yeah, I mean, that was one thing, though, because in CRKT, uh, the TITAC 2 was kind of the baseline of where I really liked the knife. Uh, it had a lot of deployment methods and everything. And then uh, as you are as you learn more about it, I mean, the tolerances on that knife, I appreciate them making it, uh, but just the tolerances haven't gotten better over the years. So it's kind of mm -hmm. just has a little bit more slop to it and everything. Uh, and then uh, that's where that started from. And then I just like that mechanism so much. Uh, and it was a very much a... Uh, a process uh, to get things done because uh, in uh, at least with the OEM uh, they they hadn't had a button lock before uh, so there was kind of like well this is how it should operate and then they send me a video of it and it's like well you press the button and it doesn't fall down and it's like well there's something's wrong there uh, you might want to adjust something here or there and it, it took uh, I think it was about six months uh, kind of back and forth to go okay well this is how I want it to go this is how I want it to operate uh, and then so it's it's progressed. So it's actually gotten to a point where uh, the uh, like the um, the Scorpio, I feel, has gotten uh, to kind of the next level, a little bit more refinement to it. And then um, as I'll do that, then I'll kind of you know, I'll go back to the Solaris as well and then kind of uh, work with some of those refinements too. just kind of go back and forth and uh, lessons learned from the um, Scorpio can be applied to the Solaris. Yeah, because I mean, this is where it kind of started out. I mean, this is the 3D print um, that I started with. I mean, this is the first time I got the experience knife, uh, drew it up, uh, did the 2D and then uh, the 3D side. Uh, so it's not too much different. I mean, this is uh, from 2D um, to the actual knife. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's one of the options available. Uh, so it's actually stayed pretty true to that. Uh, so that was pretty, it was a nice, uh, nice thing to do. But yeah, definitely button locks are uh, a very... Uh, finicky uh, so they're not not as straightforward as some uh, would like to to hope for uh, it is a little bit of finicky lock uh, but it is uh, it's a good lock i still like it i like it a lot and it seems like everyone likes it a lot because they are they have now become uh, very very popular um, you know my my entree into button locks was mostly through switch blades automatic knives oh definitely yeah um but uh well, for, hang on. Uh, before I ask this question, I just want to ask quickly. You mentioned the OEM. Is it the same OEM of with the Solaris and the um, and the Scorpio? Yeah, uh, Solaris and Scorpio are both with QSP. QSP. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so I want to talk about this setup here, and and uh, mm -hmm. usually I don't get technical, but um, it's interesting to look at this. This is the same setup as the Polaris. I I mean, I mean as the Solaris, I believe. Uh, -huh. uh In terms of, um, you know, you have the the a flipper tab way forward and then yep. just behind that you have the button lock and then just behind that the pivot and then kind of much further back um at the flipper tab and then of course you have the fuller all of these ways you can open up the knife um this angle right here is what interests me having that yeah. flipper so far forward uh, yeah, tell me a little the, about that yeah definitely because uh, then uh, for myself uh, for the the flipper tab uh i found that at least was my thought on it. Uh, basically, you have a little bit more uh, pull on it. Uh, you get a little bit more travel because if you have a flipper tab kind of at the bottom side, uh, you get a very a little travel. Uh, mm -hmm. But when you actually use it um, on the top side, oh, I can't really get that. so I mean, you have basically all this travel that goes down. And that's where it's, it's kind of a hit or miss because some people like it, some people don't. Uh, but uh, that's where uh, I like to have um, that type of pull for it. Uh, and then that's also where people have issue because they feel that, well, the, this thumb stud should be closer. Well, well, I can't have it closer because everything that you move within a design, uh, you have to move something else. So if, if you say <laughs> that you want you want the thumb stud closer, it's like, well, then I have to change the handle. So I have to pull this back. I have to change uh, where the pivot's located. Uh, so uh, and even with this uh, basically front uh, a front troil, which you don't get on too many of the knives. Uh, sometimes you see a troil that takes up a good deal of the blade. And um, that's kind of how I designed uh, the original Scorpio, I mean the Solaris, and that's where it moved into the Scorpio because the Scorpio was going to be uh, the mini uh, Solaris, uh, but my wife said it does not look like uh, the other knife. So why are you naming it the same thing? I was like, no, yeah, you're probably about right. So I changed it up a little. Well, I think, uh, uh, well, lots of things, but uh, on that point, I think the blade does look kind of scorpion-ish. Yeah. Um, you know, it has that vibe. And I got to say, uh, thank you for putting Jimping up there on the clip. Uh, I, I know it's very useful for, mm -hmm. for utility uh, 
cuts and uses, but I just think it looks cool. I really like it. That's part of what uh, gives this to me such a unique look. I'm a, I'm a huge clip point uh, fan and I happen to be going through a huge Bowie knife phase yes. right now. So anything clip point uh, really gets to me, but that the jimping, just the look of it, the jimping, the crown spine and uh, the fuller here all coming together at that front portion just looks amazing. Yeah, and I don't see it very often for that because even I added, uh, it's a little bit harder to see on this one, but there's a little bit of um, kind of a, a, a drop area. So you probably see it more, a little bit more on yours, uh, but there's kind of a place for your thumb mm -hmm. to land. So when you actually yep. have your thumb up here, it actually lands up there. And and that's one thing I don't really see on too many knives as far as having jimping all the way up on the, um, the actual clip point. Uh, so that was, I kind of took it off on some of, like, I saw it on some hunting knives, uh, but not really too much on other regular EDC knives. So that was uh, one thing that helped out with even, uh, like, your, your draw cuts or plunge cuts. So if you actually just want to go in just a little bit, you can kind of mm. just go up a little bit and actually kind of adjust as far as how deep that cut's going to go into the box. Yeah, because uh, when you're worried about cutting whatever's in there and you're yeah. just, yeah, yeah. Um, so uh, this, when did this knife, when did the Scorpio uh, get released? When was this? Uh, uh, Scorpio, I forgot which month, but it did come out this year. Uh, so it was basically about once a year I'm coming out with design. Uh, the uh, CDS that we'll talk about later, uh, that was, I was planning on having it this year. It's probably going to be a 2023 model uh, for that guy. Okay, so uh, before we talk about the CDS, let's just talk about your overall philosophy for the company for for Orion. Um, mm -hmm. uh, I know uh, your, your tagline is invest in your lifestyle um, or that's one of one of your yep. taglines on yep, your correct. on your website. Um, what does that mean? And um, and what, what is it? What are your goals with uh, with this knife company? Yeah, I think that's I guess the the big thing is like to make a big company actually actually have it be uh, something that I can uh, live off of. Cause right now, I mean, it is still a hobby thing. I'm reinvesting the money back into it. Uh, so would it be nice to be a Kershaw Benchmade, Chris Reeve type of knife company? Uh, yeah, it would be still a lot of headaches probably for a lot of that. Uh, but uh, I just want to be able to, still enjoy it, still have a, a usable place for a knife. And that's a, another reason why I don't have so many models is I want it to have um, just a purpose. And why is it in the market? Why, why would this even exist? Is it just another drop point uh, that's out there? Uh, and that's kind of with the uh, trajectory of it. Uh, it went from Kickstarter uh, to uh, the second run of this Lars and then uh, the Scorpio. So it's just kind of progressed and then being able to kind of look back and see, okay, well, like I would think about it, it's like, okay, that's going to cost a thousand dollars. Like, oh man, that's going to be a lot of money. And then now it's, it's a kind of a different mindset of like, okay, that's going to be a thousand dollars. Yeah, I can see that. And then you just spend it. Uh, and that's where I'm kind of allowing uh, and I guess thanking the community for it because it allows uh, their support to be able to kind of uh, keep on going because uh, without um, them enjoying it, telling their friends, buying some of the products, and I just couldn't move forward. Uh, part of, of that, well, that's what I was actually asking about, the very last part. Uh, a big part of your company seems to be, um, at least with the three knives I've experienced, one a prototype and two, mm -hmm. uh, you know, the Solaris and the Scorpio, is that you aim to make some kind of luxury goods, we'll call them that, because they're beautifully made, stylishly designed, and 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 great tools for, for what they are, pocket knives. Um, but you're making them affordable. <laughs> you know, these are things yeah. that are... And you're, uh, especially with the Solaris, and I imagine uh, this will... Uh, be the same thing, but you're making them very, very customizable, uh, which is something that we see in much higher end knives like Hinderer knives, mm. uh, for instance, kind of pride themselves on that. Um, tell, tell me a little bit about what it takes to to do that. Uh, it's, it's a lot because then uh, that's where uh, with anybody that uh, that sends me an email, uh, I reply to those, but then people would go, OK, well, can you just make one without without a flipper tab? Can you make one with this color, that color, uh, change uh, the certain section? Uh, I would like to, uh, but then uh, I, the investment on that is uh, hundreds of units. Uh, so 
if the market's there for it, uh, great, then I can do that. Uh, but that's where it is a, a bigger investment than just being able to do like a, um, like a 3D print of it. And then I don't have in-house manufacturing. So it's just not a matter of kind of changing a few things and uh, doing a different cut. Uh, so it is working with that OEM process or ODM process. And that's one thing I want to talk about too, as far as like those differences, because like, yeah. there is a difference between ODM and OEM. Uh, but uh, that's where it, it's just a lot of different things. Uh, you try and uh, I think it's still a matter of like the, the Solaris was like my knife uh, that hopefully people liked. And then I'm trying to kind of expanding on that. I still want to like the knife, but I don't, I, I don't want to make something that I just dislike. Although sometimes the market uh, kind of has something that they like a lot. And it's like, okay, well, I'll just make one. Oh. But I, I do want to make something that I like. So I see what you're saying. You're, you, you don't want to, you don't want to be influenced too much by uh, the market. You want to be the influence on the market. Yeah. What's missing from it. Uh, so that's where it's just like, uh, what's the purpose of it? Uh, I think uh, it's something that still stuck with me. Now, when I was still just doing the blade banter side, I did an interview um, at one of the blade shows with like Leon Ma. And he was like, what makes you, what makes you different? Like what, why like i mean that's kind of the reason it's like why are you even in existence why are you there uh, as far as the, and that was the youtube side but uh kind of the same thing goes for the knife side it's like why why am i doing this what what niche is it uh what is it uh bringing to the market and not just another knife yeah i i guess i guess you have to really um auger down you know as someone who likes all knives you know uh, ranging from all budgets and all styles, uh, I could see it being, um, I, I don't know, difficult to, to, to just kind of pick one lane and, and, and stay in it and master it. And, um, but, you know, but, but this concept of having a couple of designs and working those and, and, um, part of what I was asking you before was about the customization. Not only yeah. do you make these, uh, these multi-row bearing super knives, uh, affordable, um, but they're also like Solaris, uh, very customizable. D tell us about some of the things one can do if they have a Solaris and they want to make it more their own. Yeah, I mean, uh, even on the table here, as far as some of this information mm. goes, uh, so this is like a hydro dip. Uh, like Nico, um, he's normally at like the artisan booth, uh, so he does hydro dipping. Uh, so that's something that's available here. This is on a G10, uh, so a different backspacer here. Uh, might add a lanyard at some point. I'm personally not a lanyard person, and that's why I just like, well, for the size of knife, I didn't go with it. But yeah, you can change pivot collars, uh, backspacers. Uh, also have uh, work with uh, uh, chroma scales. Uh, so chroma scales is the one that did this one. So this is the uh, uh, Scorpio, uh, but this is with uh, the frag pattern. Uh, mm -hmm. So this is a 3D printed scale. Uh, so that actually allows for a lower batch uh, and uh, a lot more customization as far as the colors, patterns, and everything that can be printed for it. And that's just a plastic one. And actually, it does drop the weight as well. So it's actually even less uh, than the carbon fiber huh. because the carbon fiber um, uh, is this one. So between the G10 and the, um, the chroma scale, uh, with the chroma scale backspacer, it drops like 0.8 ounces. Wow. Uh, so it, it's still not as rigid as a carbon fiber or a G10. Uh, but it is still a usable device for it. And even for the pricing, like I think it's a fair price for like a, a carbon fiber, $35. Uh, because then I think majority of them go for about uh, 65 plus wow. uh, for yeah. a carbon fiber option. And so it's just something that everybody wants to make a knife of their own. It's kind of nice to be able to take your knife out of your pocket and like not have the exact same one that everybody else does. Uh, and those are the kind of the options that I want to have for that. Yeah, I mean, I, I couldn't agree with you more. Um, uh, just like we have, we all have our favorite designs out there, uh, favorite production designs, but to have have one, you know, I have a couple of knives with custom scales, uh, especially Emerson's. And I, I prize those because they're just a little bit different, but it's the same knife everyone knows and loves, but it's mine. It's my version. Uh, and before I ask you about o OEM versus ODM, uh, I want to say thank you for putting a lanyard um, yeah. option on the scorpio i am a, a fob guy i take them on put them off take them on you know i but i like the option especially on a small knife uh to me uh, not only for extracting and for feeling it in hand but i don't know it's sort of like jewelry for the n little knife itself so yeah i appreciate that 
Yeah, and I didn't want to add a post to it. So that's why, I mean, if you see on it, I mean, it doesn't have a post. Uh, so it's not like the hole that's drilled in the right, side. And that's right. one thing I, I don't like about like the pair of three, uh, as far as uh, they kind of relocated the lanyard hole for the pot. I mean, the we relocated the pocket for the lanyard mm, hole. Yeah. I didn't, I didn't want to do that. So that's why it's kind of a hidden one there. The Just lanyard the hole you could you could drive a truck through. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but take the guts out of it. I tried to um, initially because I'm not a lanyard person. I was trying to like take the whole paracord and shove it in the hole. And it's like it was just very frustrating. So just take the guts out a little bit, and then it will just fish right through. Yeah, yeah, you can take it out and burn it, make it pointy, and stick it through. Yeah, and, and yeah. So uh, you mentioned uh, OEM and ODM. What is? Mm -hmm. Well, explain what OEM is, and then what's the difference with an ODM. Yeah, OEM and ODM, it, it's kind of almost melted a little bit, but originally the, the OEM side was really you're just taking every specification, every part, and then they're just making it for you. Uh, the majority of um, the knives, even uh, with my own, because I don't take every little piece down to the um, the angle of the lock face, I might uh, ask for adjustments here and there, but I'm not taking it to that level. So really it's in essence, a lot of the knife designs that come out are ODM is original design manufacturing and not OEM, where you kind of give them all the information, all the um, tool paths, and they just make your parts. Uh, so that's kind of those the, in a nutshell as far as ODM and OEM. So in so uh, how do you uh, employ the two differently when you're bringing one given knife to, to market? Yeah, I, I think that's a lot of where... Uh, the ODM side, if you use that term, is the majority of what happens with it because then you can really take a napkin drawing and uh, a lot of the uh, companies will take that and then they, they'll produce a knife out of it. They won't, you won't need to be telling them, okay, well, I want um, the lock face to be at a one degree angle and this needs to be at this point. It's like, okay, well, this is my design. Then they kind of convert it over and then they make it. And then they give you a prototype and say, yes, this is what okay. I want to make. So that's more of an ODM style, but it's, it's kind of melted a little bit as far as like, it's almost, it's spoken to in the same light now, as far as OEM and ODM. Uh, I, I would, um, I was going to say, yeah, because it, it seems like a lot of the OEMs, when, when we're talking uh, to various people about it, uh, they have a lot of designers of their own who are, a, there to translate whatever the design specs that come in on a design are to make it mm -hmm. flow with their manufacturing process. But also, there are guys like me who have great ideas uh, drawn in the margins of their legal pads at work. Yeah. And, you know, you just want to Xerox that and send it over to them and see yeah. what you can do with this. So that would be more the ODM. Uh, that would be. And, and and that's just uh, from what I've known about it. And that's kind of uh, what I've kind of gathered as far as now what I put together. Uh, so definitely, I mean, if people disagree, let me know in the comments too. And kind of we can discuss that. But uh, that's uh, been my idea as far as uh, that difference between the OD OEM and ODM side of business. So you've been working with QSP uh, on the on the production of the Scorpio and the Solaris. Uh, what's it been like working with them? Yeah, I mean, it's been a good process. Uh, so it's still uh, been kind of that back and forth. Again, uh, when we're going through the original button lock, it, it took a little bit longer just because they were doing frame locks and liar locks. Uh, so that they didn't have um, and that they just brought out. Uh, a button lock under them, uh, which is like a going gear exclusive, but uh, there's currently, they didn't have a button lock um, in their lineup. So it was kind of having to explain and show uh, what I wanted to do, how it should work. And then when I was actually uh, handed them knives, because in one of the shows they actually came out um, from China. So I was actually able to bring um, kind of my button locks and go, well, this is the button locks available. This is kind of how I want it to work. This is how everything, um, uh, how it should lock up when you press the button, it should drop because uh, it's really, you don't have in that tension on there. Uh, so yeah, it was, it was, a, it was definitely a process to uh, get uh, through everything and actually get it going. So you, <laughs> you actually brought uh, the button lock to QSP. It sounds yeah. like, um, and now they just came out with a button lock. I, I think they have you to thank. Yeah, uh, they, I mean, it's similar. I think I'm going to, I have one, I bought one. Uh, so I'm going to try and actually, I think some of the parts are the same. So I can actually switch out some of the parts. Uh, the button has a little bit of a different design on it. I could actually put on maybe to the Solaris, but I'm going to check on that. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, but uh, yeah, it's the, the button lock was around. I mean, I wasn't the first one to bring it out. There's still uh, the USA side. Um, uh, one guy that used to work at Gerber, his name I'm uh, losing right now, uh, but uh, he's in Oregon. Uh, and then there's, uh, I think there was Kaiser and, and Tangram. And like really Tangram, they had a really good button lock. Yeah, yeah. It was off of Kaiser and they were kind of ahead of the game. I mean, if they had just stuck with it a little bit longer, I mean, they, they were ahead of Savibi and everybody else uh, when it came to that. Uh, but yeah, there's a, I think a lot of it came about, I mean, even like, um, I think uh, women carry knives and stuff. So it's like kind of, I started, I kind of kickstarted a little bit and maybe that's the case. Maybe it's not. We'll see. Um, yeah. The, the, uh, I, w w actually what, what I was suggesting was that you actually helped QSP cut their teeth on yeah. making these button locks. And I think that's actually pretty cool. That's, uh, that's kind of the, the, um, uh, back and forth nourishing of this community, you know, uh, lots of people with fresh uh, design ideas going to people with a lot of expertise, but maybe not uh, the ideas. And then you bring that together and then you, everyone's benefiting. Yeah. Yeah. yeah so uh, the Cetus, let's talk about this yeah. knife. Let me give you my impressions yep, uh, uh, before, because I haven't made the video yet. But after tonight, I will, and then I'll get this back to you. Uh, but thank you. Uh, I, it's an honor to have a prototype in hand. Uh, this knife strikes me as, this is a full-size knife, bigger than I would imagine both the Solaris and the and the Scorpio. Yeah. I know it's bigger than the Scorpio. Um, it, it seems like a like purpose designed utility knife with that tip down and with that edge angle, that downward edge angle, mm -hmm. you know, pull cuts and cutting straps and using that point and everything. Like, so it seems like a really great full size utility knife. But uh, when I got it in hand, I was like, oh, it's a gnunting. It's a it's a little <laughs> curved uh, sickle like sword for my pocket. Like to me, this yeah. reminds me of that. You know what I'm talking about, right? Yeah. 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 I think you've showed it off on one of your other now live streams. Oh, OK. <laughs> yeah. yeah. But yeah, I mean, definitely the size difference between it. And that was definitely a purpose as far as that downward angle, because really when you're actually uh, cutting into things, I mean, this is where I mean, it's right there as far as any tip. And most people really they just cut uh, Amazon box and whatnot. So, I mean, that's really what that's there for. I mean, I'm sure I mean, even for yourself, you find other reasons. It's like, oh, that would be a great other tool for something else. Yeah, uh, yeah. But but that's really where it came about as far as that goes, because I wanted to have that downward tip angle. Uh, but I was like, well, how am I going to fit that in there? And he was like, was like, I don't know how that's going to work. So I was just kind of playing around with it some time. And uh, it kind of uh, came about because then uh, actually Buck of all places came out with a similar, like a downward angle. And I was like, oh. And then so that's kind of where I kind of ran with it. I like, got out my paper and started drawing it and everything else. I was like, this is the way to go. And huh. that's kind of where this came from. Uh, also, though, in addition to that downward angle, the overall uh, arcing uh, shape of of the spine from the from the pommel to the tip uh, gives the whole thing, even though it's a very gentle and and nearly neutral handle, gently curved and nearly neutral handle, the overall arc on the spine gives it almost a pistol grip effect. Mm -hmm. So if you were to and and the fact that the point is low on the blade, if you were to use this in a thrusting motion uh, for whatever purpose, um, the tip is right is right where you need it to be without having to bend your your uh wrist in a yeah. in a weird and unnatural way so I, I think this is a very interesting design and and i i i can't tell uh i can't tell exactly what you were thinking when you made this were you thinking both utility and tactical or am i just being uh... a little bit less tactical because i'm not a, a <laughs> tactical guy in a sense but then i mean that's where it goes about to people like yourself that actually uh works with the knives in that manner uh so it works out well that way because i actually in some sense, I had a tactical idea because uh, so it, it's not a uh, bolster lock. It's I call it just almost like a modified frame lock. Mm -hmm. uh, so it actually does have um, the full cover that goes across the whole thing, but it does have the exposed uh, frame. So when you actually are holding on to it, uh, that's going to actually um, engage it more than sometimes liner locks. Oh, if you grab man. it too much, uh, then you're actually going to be disengaging it, which is not a great thing. Uh, so that's where um, I kind of made this uh, cover a little bit less. Um, so you can actually still um, possibly grip it, right? Right, so that your uh, your squeezing fingers is uh, still have room to push down on the lock bar there. Yeah, um, yeah. So you're still going to be engaging it uh, when you're grabbing it, and also um, 
when you're actuating it, I mean, you can put your fingers anywhere on this and not actually, not actually mess with that uh, frame lock at all. Yeah. And that's a, that's a huge deal for me because that's very frustrating. If you go to, to, it's, I find on thinner bodied knives, you go to flip it and, and it's like, ow, and it doesn't come out. You hurt <laughs> yeah. your finger. <laughs> um, yeah. Very cool. A different, totally different placement of the flipper tab. Uh, you have the flipper tab far forward here and here you have it further back. You have it jimped all the way around the, the tab, which is important, I yeah. believe. And then you have it after this. And I believe that's why this is a good flipper. Uh, what, even with the flipper tab behind this is that yeah. you have that sort of. Yeah. It's a follow through. So, so, I mean, you kind of start with one place and you're just falling through and as I yeah. fail it there, but, uh, <laughs> Uh, but yeah, you just follow through on it. And then it actually, um, the flipper tab will hide in here. So that's where it goes. So again, going back to design. Uh, so if you go and say, okay, well, I want the flipper tab. If this gets out of focus. I want the flipper tab uh, higher or lower. Uh, it's not going to work once it's open as far as where that flipper tab lands. Mm -hmm. Right, right. Because it nestles inside the uh, finger guard. That's a yeah. another thing I mentioned before that I like. I also like these uh, covers uh, because it's sort of an elegant solution to uh, having an ambidextrous uh, uh, pocket, pocket clip yeah. without having a little notch cut in there that that is unsightly or that you have to make a filler tab for anything like yeah. that. It's nice. It just kind of slips under there, and and that's that. And the screws, of course, are recessed because uh, because you listen. Uh, <laughs> the uh, I, I, these covers here. Now you have G10. This is a mm -hmm. steel frame lock, right? Uh, it's steel on one side, aluminum on the front. Uh, so the show side is aluminum. Oh. Uh, so just to drop the weight down a little bit. So if I went steel, steel, it would uh, add a good bit of weight oh. to it. Uh, so yeah, it's an aluminum front side. Uh, so this front side is going to be aluminum. And then the back side is that steel frame lock uh, for it. Uh, so eventually, if it does well, we'll do titanium and everything. Uh, but uh, that's kind of, I guess, going back to like the goals of things like like my goal for a, a model is to arrival a large company in what they would consider um, successful. Uh, mm -hmm. So most of the things that I've sold so far, uh, it's it's nice, it's good. Uh, but um, if, if it was probably like a very large organization, they'd be like, well, that's the worst selling knife that we got in the lineup. Let's drop it. Uh, so that's where I kind of want to grow to that. Uh, you have uh, on the Scorpio, you have a very, very, Thin behind the edge, a uh, flat grind, right? That's a flat grind. Yeah, flat grind. Yeah. Uh, so on the on the uh, Cetus, you've gone with a, a hollow grind, or at least yep. in this prototype. Yeah, uh, it will what, be a hollow grind. Yeah. Okay. So what? Why? Uh, every, everybody likes hollow grind. So this goes, I, I guess, to markets. Uh, so I mean, yeah, the life of your blade uh, with a hollow grind, you're going to have a lot more life on it. Uh, with that cutting, you're going to have basically the front of it. Uh, then it kind of doesn't have that drag across the rest of the blade. Uh, that's one reason why I actually do like a flat grind in a sense though, because then when you're cutting it, it has a very uh, uh, even push uh, mm -hmm. where it, you're not having to kind of guide the blade. It actually guides itself. Uh, so that's one reason I like a flat grind, uh, but a, a hollow grind is a nice uh, knife for cutting. It is a nice knife for the life of the knife because it doesn't fatten up because really once you start sharpening it, then it starts to get fatter and fatter and you get that bigger behind the edge thickness and then it might not cut the way that you want it to. Uh, this, sorry if I'm flipping it too much, uh, nope. uh, but th this one, uh, I really, really like the fuller flipping on mm -hmm. the Cetus, uh, is so it, I, I haven't heard of, at least that I know of an aluminum, half aluminum, half steel frame lock, uh, knife. Is this something new or is this something that's been happening? I think it's, I think it's been radar? around, um, I don't, I don't know too many that do it, but it is something that's been around uh, for uh, that setup. Because uh, yeah, you can't do aluminum against steel. Uh, that's what when it first um, when I saw the buck. Actually, I could probably grab it too. But uh, the buck one is that same style as far as that um, aluminum and steel. Because industry, I thought it was aluminum because like everything I saw on it uh, is called the Highline, uh, and that one was like okay, oh. well, aluminum frame lock. How does that work? And then like, I didn't see any inserts or anything. I was like, that doesn't work, does it? And then it came out. I was like, okay, that's a frame lock on the, I mean, the steel on the one side and aluminum on the other side. Okay. All right. Cause I have recently, and now I can't remember exactly where it was. I have heard of an aluminum frame lock. Uh, and I was, how does that work? And that one has an insert, but now I can't remember what that, 
Yeah, that was a case knife, a uh, case Marilla and a case, um, another one out there, but it's like uh, their river. I mean, they named it a few different ways. But yeah, that's an aluminum one uh, as far as a frame lock with the insert. That's right. And, and, and uh, if, for those of you who don't know, uh, David also has an encyclopedic knowledge of, of these knives. I mean, of, of the kind of knives we all know, love and collect because you two are a collector and a reviewer. Um, though now that you're running this company, I think, yeah. I, I think you're more of a knife company uh, guy. Um, uh, what was I going to, Oh, I was going to ask you about the, um, the, so the knife, the Cetus you have is in all mm -hmm. black and you have a wood, uh, yeah. wood, wood covers on this, uh, yeah. which I have been, you know, I've been talking about this for a while now. I'm, I'm just into it right now. I'm into wood uh, on handles, natural materials. I love, um, but wood, this looks so nice. What kind of wood is that? And tell us about the options you want to see the Cetus come out in. Yeah, and this is going to go around with the same type of customization. Uh, initially, it's going to be a G10 or wood. Uh, wood's probably going to be like a $10 premium. Uh, now, I forgot the name of this one. It's it's like a white wood or something, uh, at least what the OEM was saying as far as it goes. And I kind of looked it up and say, well, what is that? Uh, I had never found the actual, like, what type of tree it is. Uh, but that's what they were calling it is a, like a white wood. Hmm. Uh, but but that's going to be what this is. And it's really a simple design for it. So, yeah, eventually I can see doing like a carbon fiber and uh, doing like a full titanium uh, one as well. Oh, yeah. I mean, the possibilities are, are endless with something like that uh, when you can just put covers on there. And then when people get enthusiastic about it, like I know they did with the Solaris, people start making their own scales. And uh, and that kind of thing. How how do you feel about that as a um, as a knife company owner? Um, other people making parts for your knives, and I don't know how how common that is with your knives, but um, how do you feel about that? Uh, I think it's good. I mean, even uh, with Ben, what he did, I haven't gone that far. I mean, anybody that asked, I had two people ask about uh, for the Scorpio anyway, for the actual the um, the step file, so they actually don't need to start from scratch. So I gave it to them to do a three uh, three D prints for. So anything that's really good. I mean, if if I think anywhere across the market, if you're going to have aftermarket, uh, it helps the manufacturer as well because then they have to have the base of it to have the part. So you're still, I mean, it works out both ways. If you can have a market for it, uh, for the aftermarket, then that it will help the OEM. Yeah. The yes. Yes. That's what I never understood about. Um, well, I'll, I'll name them companies yeah. like hinderer, you know, like, uh, when, uh, I remember they went after a, a scale maker who was it? RC blade works, I think a few years it. back. And, uh, I have some of their scales for a couple of my hinderers, great scales. And, the thing, I, the thing that vexed me always was, well, this is something that gets people excited about your product. Um, why don't you embrace it? Why wouldn't you yeah. embrace it? You know, you can't expect to have a, a, a lock, a hammer lock hold on every single thing that, that touches your knives. And if you have people who are so excited about them that they want to collect them and get all, make all sorts of different parts for them, that's a sign of success, I would imagine. Yeah, I would think so. Uh, that's one thing that eventually I want to get it a little bit thinner because uh, kind of going off of like why, like people say, oh, well, that's way too thick. I don't like it because mm -hmm. of how thick this knife is. Uh, it works well for a small knife, uh, but if I do make it thinner, I mean, that's where uh, it goes about with the um, the collars. The collars, I'll have to protrude it out a little bit because the mm -hmm. material underneath of it is going to be very thin. Uh, so I won't have that same type of collar. Uh, so there's a few different things that go into it, uh, even the hardware itself. Uh, and that's one thing uh, kind of going in the mindset of, I guess, more of the car company style. Uh, a lot of these parts. So if you have if you have a Solaris, uh, maybe people knew, maybe people don't. Uh, but uh, I'll just stick to the other one. Uh, a lot of these parts are interchangeable. Mm. Yeah. So, so the reason for that is not trying to be cheap. It's just I would like to have uh, like a part spin that is not every single knife has a different part. So if if you have a collar, uh, it will work on the other one. Uh, if I do add a lanyard uh, to this one, I might have this on this knife. So then you can actually, if you have it customized, then you can. Okay, well, I want to change it from this knife to this knife. I want to change these collars to this knife from this one. Uh, it's something that's available to it. 
Uh, and that's kind of was the plan for it uh, to have uh, kind of a little bit more customization because initially uh, when I was making uh, this knife, I was going to actually make a small version of this knife and actually allow you to change uh, the handle and also the scale hmm. uh, to make it smaller, but it didn't really work out. So uh, <laughs> that's where it kind of uh, came up with what it is. Well, that, that concept of having kind of off the shelf parts for not, uh, off the shelf parts for Orion knives. I think that is a great idea um, for everyone involved or for both parties involved. It makes mm -hmm. for very efficient business and manufacturing on for your side. And then for, for the knife junkie or for the, for the collector. Oh man. Yeah, of course. I mean, that's great uh, to have two Orion knives and know that I can swap. Uh, well, if they're both uh, sol sol solar, uh, yeah. I mean, yeah, that, that you could swap 100% of the parts, but even going between two different models that you could swap a lot of those parts. People love that. People like making Franken knives. I know I do, you know, taking yeah. the best parts of different favorite parts of different knives that fit together and, and do it. So I think that makes sense all around. Yeah. And that's where like the, the hard part about for me is like, I'm always uh, chasing, like, it's hard to not compare against other folks, other companies. And then that's where I have a hard time with, because I'm like, well, this company's coming out and like, like they sell it in like five minutes or something. And I was just like, well, I mean, I, I have it. I haven't sold out of my products. And then I was just trying to kind of not uh, compare myself too much to other people, because I feel I've been successful, but like, like it's kind of like always pushing the margin of like, okay, what is success? And like, what is it uh, to be an actual designer an actual company? Because it, it, it almost feels like, well, I'm not there yet. I'm, it's like, I got a ways to go still. Uh, two things on that is I, I think that when I, I would imagine that when you sell out your knives immediately, that's a lot of pressure because you want to repeat that. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and when you stop repeating that, it's it, it might feel like, geez, no one loves me anymore because oh, I'm not yeah, selling yeah. out in 20 minutes. Uh, so I could see I could see both sides of the coin uh, being both frustrating and thrilling, uh, you know, selling out quickly or having a, a stock that you can always come back to. And that that's always there that people can buy because there's also uh, as a knife collector, nothing more frustrating than than missing the drop or not having three hundred and fifty five bucks yeah. available when that drop comes through. And then you got to wait for the secondary and all that. But knowing that a company like yours has stock is exciting. And then the other thing about comparing yourself, um, you know, uh, it's like Jordan Peterson says, compare your, don't compare yourself to other people, but compare yourself to who, to yesterday, who you were yesterday and what yeah. Orion knives was yesterday. And as long as you're keep doing that little incremental growth, like that's, that's how you build a foundation. Yeah. And, and I can see that you just try and not get caught up in the weeds of all that. Uh, yeah. but definitely, definitely. So, uh, but yeah, it's been a good run. Uh, it's been something that uh, I didn't want to do a lot of the, the pre-orders, uh, that's why um, the the Scorpio uh, really was funded off of uh, the Solaris. So I had it available, and it was just something that was like when I released it, it was kind of, okay. If you want to buy it, it's here. Yeah, it's not a you want to buy it. Okay, it'll be six months. It'll be three months. Uh, one thing that I mentioned about the Solaris uh, on one of my live feeds recently was how okay for me this is uh, um, uh, not in my wheelhouse. This is smaller than most of the folding knives I collect, uh, though I have recently been getting more into smaller knives. But my primary carry is always larger. It's always around a four inch blade. That's just what I prefer. Um, and then my secondary would be something this size, say, for instance. But to me, and I do not have giant hands. So I would say that that my point will probably count for people with giant hands even more. But this uh, being a smaller knife, I like the width of it. It feels yeah. good and controllable in hand. And it, that goes for some of uh, the, the, I just did a podcast uh, uh, on tiny knives, my 10 favorite tiny knives. And this, this was too big to be on the list, but I do mention <laughs> yeah. this as, as a smaller knife that uh, has a really, really good feel and grip because of that width. And I mentioned a number of other knives that, um, I think are successful in, in micro or small versions because the makers m maintained the full width, even though they had to make everything else smaller, that full width mm. counts, especially with a three finger grip or, or, uh, or compromise grip like yeah. that. Yeah. Smaller. 
Yeah, I mean, I think that's a good thing worth it. Uh, anybody that's handled it when I was in the kind of the prototyping stage really liked it. Uh, so it's been a good model. Uh, the reviewers that have seen it so far uh, have had positive things to say about it. So that's always nice to hear uh, from the community as far as uh, what they think about it. Uh, and then uh, just just enjoying the product. What role would you say the community has had in, and by the community, I mean the knife community has had in, um, well, in your embarking on this business venture, but also in, in your success? Yeah, I mean, couldn't be done without them because uh, everything was based off of uh, just the channel when I started the Blade Bender channel. Uh, and then when it rolled into um, just meeting other people, other channels, other community members, because I mean, at least in my area, I'm starting to know a little bit more people in the Salem area. But I mean, really, you, it was like you show somebody a knife and then you talk about it and they go, they kind of give you kind of a blank stare and you're like, <laughs> it's like, it's like yeah, okay. Uh, but the community helped a lot because it's something that was able to support uh, where I wanted to go. Um, I give the motivation to, to try it. Uh, and then uh, that's kind of grew into being able to kind of grow things and actually uh, continue on with different models. Cause if, if it wasn't there and I was just, uh, just not in the community and not uh, talking with other folks, it would probably be a lot harder to launch a knife and a knife uh, brand and a knife model because like nobody knows you. You don't have that uh, personal relationship with people and honest uh, feedback. Because then, I mean, if I, if I created a knife that was like very ugly, horrible to, to feel in hand, uh, action was was terrible and then like you only had people around you it was like yeah do it it's an amazing thing to do that would be a horrible thing to do so that, that's what's yeah. nice to uh, to kind of send it around get that input uh, and then uh, just hopefully continue to grow be able to uh, do different models uh, and going back to even I used to invest in your lifestyle because the lifestyle of every person is different as far as what you're looking for, what you like, what you need. Uh, and then that's uh, kind of where that goes. Cause initially there was the push button as far as uh, the original button locks, but it's kind of expanded more than that. And that's why I went with the invest in your lifestyle because uh, the next one is a frame lock, uh, which is not a button lock and I can't do push the button. Right. Right. Uh, but uh, that's kind of where that uh, progressed and changed. So having um, started Blade Banter Channel and having and knowing people uh, in the community as you started up uh, Orion Knives, uh, you have like a built in focus group, you know, which is nice. And 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 unlike a corporation out there who's trying to assemble a focus group, you know that they're all experts or 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 at least aficionados in their own taste uh, in knives. So what kind of. Um, um, uh, or, or how much did their feedback affect the final designs of, say, the Solaris or, or any uh, of them? The only thing that I can remember as far as a, a, a major feedback that was kind of a design thing, because initially I wasn't going to have pivot collars. Uh, uh, Jack Farmboy, uh, which was a part of the community, uh, he actually is uh, on with uh, Giant Mouse now. Oh. Uh, he, uh, he, he was like, well, talking about like pivot collars, I was like, yeah, that actually might look pretty nice. So that was one thing that really uh, helped out with it because uh, some of the other ones, there's like little tweaks here and there, uh, but it was still like, um, like you take in the information and go, well, this is, but this is still what I like and what I mm -hmm. want to put out. Uh, that's where it was like, even the with the lanyard, even some people said, well, I didn't buy the knife because it didn't have a lanyard on it. It's like, well, I didn't, I didn't want to put a lanyard because it's, I didn't feel like it was necessary. Yeah. And it's kind of like, wow. If, if, I mean, you know, everyone's got their taste and that's it. That's it. That's there's no accounting for taste, but to me it's, it's crazy that someone wouldn't buy a knife cause there's no lanyard hole. Yeah. Um, cause you can buy a drill. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> yeah, no. I'm just kidding. I, I would yeah. never dream of doing such a thing. Well, you um, can always do it. It's your knife. Yeah, it's yeah, exactly. Um, uh, so you have a bunch of, not a bunch, but you have other things to support the lifestyle. And, and actually you sent this to me and I'm grateful yeah. because I think it's so cool. Uh, this, this is an Orion knives. And I, I looked at it and I was like, ah, it reminds me of the old days yeah. with the CDs. Yeah. And then CD I opened case, it up yeah. and I'm like, Oh my God, this beautiful case with this totally plush. 
I called it the walls of a 1970s <laughs> custom van. You Shag know? carpet. Yeah, it's so it's so lovely, and the way they're uh, counterpositioned so that they don't rub each other. Uh, yeah. So and and then and then you also sent me. Um, it's right over there. I still have to get it put together with my girls, but also a little wooden version of one of your knives. Yeah. Tell, yeah. And how does? Well, I was going to ask you about about your merchandising ideas and and how. Uh, you know what 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 how you want to proceed with this stuff too because i i really like the and you also have a knife care kit i like yep. all of the sort of uh, extra accessories and ancillary stuff that you get in in the knife uh knife world yeah i i mean i went with this one because uh, i didn't really find something that uh most times you're not other than going to like blade show or something you're not going to take your entire collection so really i felt like four was a good size mm -hmm. uh this this fits into a priority mail um uh, the small priority box yeah. uh, so people that uh, share knives you can shove it in there it's a little tight but it still fits and you can still tape it in there uh so you can send around knives to your buddies and everything else and they can check it out and then yeah to have it kind of uh, flip side as far as not being able to kind of touch, touch each other uh, helped out a lot and then it's lined on the inside too so inside the pocket uh, is lined and this is one thing that like in I guess another design oh. aspect uh, it's like uh, when I first got in prototype wise it was just way too thin and I was like how am I going to communicate how this is going to fit or what size I want this so I was like do you guys have have snicker bars and then I was just like can you get a snicker bar and like the, I want it to fit a snicker bar. So this is actually something you could do if you want to carry candy bars. Uh, this will <laughs> fit candy bars as well. So you can fit a snicker in there. So that was really what I used uh, for a base size uh, oh for God. the knife. And it fits ballast songs. Uh, so I had it, uh, some ballast song folks check it out. Oh, nice. uh, so, so even for some uh, larger knives, uh, it will fit in there. Uh, it will work for the smaller ones, the bigger ones. Uh, but yeah, candy bars, yeah, works too. <laughs> well yeah it works great with my large friend my like my spartan harzy folder goes in there my xm24 uh little snug with the flipper tab on the outside pocket because that's such a, a huge chunker but you're you mentioned bally songs which are mm -hmm. traditionally just longer knives bigger knives yeah, yeah. yeah that's good they yeah that's pretty cool yeah it's so, in there so it's, it's so this is part of the lifestyle and uh um so what kind of things do you think um obviously knives are the are the core but what other kind of things do you want to get your your hands on uh eventually like i think some of the thought is like i almost want to have an orion product for things that are my edc uh is uh, uh kind of a thing in the back of my mind as far as what i want to do uh and then so that comes down to like uh, like a pry bar wristwatch uh, things like that. Cool. That's kind of lifestyle uh, type of things, but uh, it's just it's just going further into it and trying to figure out. Okay, well, where is that going to fit? How am I going to service that? I'm not a knife maker. I tried to get into Timex watches. Like I bought like a whole lot off of eBay and I tried to fix them and I got one working and then I broke it and it was like oh, man, it pushed it to the side. Uh, so I don't know if I want to get into like manufacturing the watches and everything else. But I I like watches. I'm not yeah. deep into it. Uh, this is just a Timex watch here. Uh, but I still like them. I still like to have it. I had a smartwatch at one point and I just, it's not the same for me. Yeah. Uh, so I like to have a, a, an actual watch, uh, but anything with the, with the brand, it's like, it's taking a shot and seeing if it works. Uh, Cause even though like um, for this one, like it's a cool idea uh, for uh, the wooden yeah. knife kit and this is USA made. Uh, it's the same people that make the spider co knife and some of the case knives. Uh, so it's a USA made product. This has been one of my biggest failures. Uh, I thought huh. it would be one that would be good for Christmas. I brought it out last year for Christmas. Uh, I sold very few. Uh, so it's really? still available. Yeah, it's still available if people want to pick it up. Uh, but it is an actual functioning knife. You can use it for like your kid's first knife or some type of kit you want to put together. But yeah, this is probably by far the biggest failure i've had so far that's, as far as the knife brand that's interesting uh, to me because uh, there's a company keckler or kleckler or something yep. uh, they're a knife company uh, but a few years ago they came out with a plastic uh, uh, uh back lock folder it was like a recurve tanto yeah um and i bought two and put them together you know pink and purple put them together with my daughter 
Um, and those those were kicking it in her like little purse and just around the girls' rooms for years. I don't know yeah. what happened to them at this point, but that's what this is about to to replace. <laughs> yeah, and, I mean, Sierra KT has theirs. Yeah, and then, I yeah, think it's the, a, such a cool idea. I yeah, mean, it's a then, great merchandising idea. I think so, but I think I think the the marketing side where I failed on it and where some of the other ones might be more successful is I don't have a knife like this yet. And I say yet, because oh, I plan on oh, doing that. Oh, 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 uh, so, yeah. so it's not really like like dad or mom gets to have the real version and you as the kid can kind of uh, go along with them and you have your wooden version. Uh, so that might be uh, where I failed on that. Now, so we'll see. Well, well, you haven't failed yet because they still yeah. exist and they still can they be still sold. Exist. They still uh, can be. But I, actually, I was thinking it was this. I was thinking it was this in a yeah. more generalized form. You know, you don't see the jimping and yeah. the flipper tab, but oh, that's yeah. So, so marketing, hey, maybe that, yes, yes, no, no, it wasn't, it wasn't that case. <laughs> it can uh, be now, it no. can be now, yeah. So, so yeah, you can have this, the Scorpio, and then your kid can have the wooden version, also a clip point. Or they can just have the Scorpio. No, oh, no, yeah, yeah, dull it a little bit. Uh, uh, but yeah, even even the USA made uh, as far as like even the maintenance kit. Uh, so this is one uh, that is uh, through Chapman Manufacturing. So it is USA made. So even the um, the blow mold is also USA made. Yeah. Uh, the only thing that is not USA made is the actual bottles. Uh, so the bottles are made in China, and I think the tips are made in China. But all the tools in here all the drivers and this little ratchet, these little um, finger drivers. Uh, so this kind of takes the, the the place of your screwdriver because I even have the little Phillips heads in there and then the little other drivers. Uh, so just trying to get, uh, so that was the plan to have a USA made product. And then this also is not a good seller. Um, so I'm just trying to figure out why. Uh, so, so I think I'm going to include, uh, this one is, is normally an optional kit uh, for it. Uh, so this is uh, uh, kind of the pro tech. Uh, so this is like Chris Reeve. So Chris Reeve bits. Um, this is like a Medford bit, which is like oh, a, a cool. T25, right. uh, like for this new pivot. Uh, and then like these are going to be the pro tech bits. So I'm thinking about just putting that with, with the kit because because at the price I was selling it before, I did raise the price a little bit because I was literally um, – basically giving these away and I still wasn't selling them too well. Oh. Uh, so, so that's where like, again, uh, the, that's my fault because marketing side, I need to build uh, something that excites people enough to go out and buy it. So I failed on that and I'm, I'll still work on it because I still like the kit and it still is a useful thing for me. I use it for even my knives as far as maintenance on it. And it's USA made because even all the other knives, all the, um, all the other bits that people love, they're not made in the US. They're German, they're yeah. China, Taiwan. Uh, this is a USA made company uh, for all the products in there. Well, and, and I will remind you, you haven't failed. You just haven't succeeded 100% yet with it. Yeah. And, you know, and it's so, learning, it's growing, it's learning. Yeah. And it's like, uh, which way do I go and uh, what could I have done better? And then that's kind of changes with uh, different product lines and everything. And what's the value in it? Because, I mean, people will pay like 200 bucks for a driver, but oh, they, man. Won't pay, they won't pay $80 for a full kit. I'll, I'll tell you what the value of that is, is that it's the full kit. I mean, I have all of that stuff, but it's been put together piecemeal and and the quality of of my knife uh, tools, knife maintenance tools vary because I've picked them up catch as catch can. You have a you have a, a full kit available with everything in it, including lubrication and all the tools that you need. And it's all of a of a the same good quality. So I don't know that that to me is the selling point. Let me ask you this. Uh, we we're mm -hmm. talking about kids and just to kind of bring it all around for full circle. Tell me about how you came up with the name Orion and, and your, your beautiful logo. Yeah. Uh, some people th still think it looks like a barbed wire, which I'm okay with that because that's really uh, something that's very distinct as well. Uh, mm -hmm. But uh, triplet boys, uh, they're, they're nine now. Uh, triplet so boys. Triplet boys. Yeah. Wow. Nine years old. Uh, so, uh, so if you have three kids, I'm not trying to downplay having three kids because it's it's still difficult, still has uh, struggles that you have with it. Uh, but uh, when you have three learning, doing things of the same age, 
you don't have the older sibling yeah. uh, helping out the younger siblings. Uh, so it is a struggle. Uh, and and uh, even I just learned that, uh, uh, what is it, uh, Nick R- Rigi, uh, also um, he's designing a knife. Uh, he has triplets that are in uh, high school now, so you oh, can survive right. and everything. So <laughs> yeah, so that came about. Uh, so the logo itself, of Orion Knives is three stars. Uh, so that's actually their favorite constellation as far as the boys is Orion cool. constellation and it's three stars. So it really uh, symbolized uh, them. So really it's three boys, three stars. Uh, so it kind of grew into that. And even if you see the pivot of the uh, Solaris, the Scorpio, uh, yep. the pivot actually has three holes in it. Kind of looks like a um, uh, something that would be like a, a universal or a customized bit. Uh, but I mean, that's three, three holes in it as well. Uh, so it kind of, it, it goes along that line and that's really where the name came from uh, as Orion knives. And it's cool because it's Orion's belt from yeah. which he hangs a knife, no doubt. <laughs> yeah, probably yeah. so. Yeah. Under 4D eyes. underwater chess, man. <laughs> yeah. Well, David, I'm, I'm excited about, uh, well, I absolutely love the Scorpio and I'm really excited about the Cetus and the, um, What's exciting to me is not only do I like this knife and think it's really cool and compelling um, for both utility and then my ideas, uh, but also it it shows a marked difference and uh, a flexibility in your designs. It's very different from your other two designs, Mm -hmm. and that's a part that I find very exciting, too, because it shows that you've got um, scope or range, I guess is the word range, and I look forward to seeing where that takes you. Yeah, and hopefully, uh, so I'm still working on a USA model. Uh, that one, uh, I haven't released photos of or anything like that. Uh, but uh, hopefully that will do better than my maintenance kit and my wooden knife. Uh, but I will advertise that uh, it is going to be premium because USA made is not inexpensive. Mm-hmm. Uh, so hopefully people uh, take that journey with me. I might go back to Kickstarter with it. I might do a pre-order, but uh, that's uh, I'm going to be doing a button lock uh, USA made product. Uh, do you have any idea uh, when you would announce the the American OEM? I'm sure people would be excited to find out who that is. Uh, yeah, I'm actually working. Uh, actually, I will. I will later. Okay, um, good. All right, keep us on tenter yeah, hooks. Yeah, yeah, I will later. Now, but yes, yeah, so I'm working with somebody. There's not very many OEMs in the United States. Yeah. Uh, so if if people know of other people, I mean boost that market up and everything uh because there's very few uh and i tried when i was bringing out the solaris is i was trying to do it usa made and i just couldn't find it uh but i will be announcing that uh i don't have the prototypes in hand yet i have the design i have the language for it uh, but i just don't have it in hand so once i get there uh then i'll uh, maybe come back and we can talk about that Outstanding. I look forward to it. David Cam, thank you so much for coming back on the Knife Junkie podcast. It's been a pleasure, sir. Yeah, appreciate it. Do you use terms like handle the blade ratio, walk and talk, hair pop and sharp, or tank like? Then you are a dork and a knife junkie. Okay, there he goes, ladies and gentlemen, David Cam of Orion Knives. Uh, One of the things we talked about that I uh, appreciate so much about uh, his model of doing business is that he has models on hand. So if you like his knives, you can actually go to the website and buy them. And uh, who could ask for more? Uh, Go check that out at orionknives.com. And, uh, of course, you can check them out on all the usual uh, uh, social media spots. And also check out the Blade Banter channel and and some of the uh, videos uh, up there about his taste in other knives all right ladies and gentlemen that does it be sure to check in with us on wednesday for the midweek supplemental thursday night for thursday night knives 10 p.m uh, standard uh, eastern standard time right here on youtube facebook and twitch and uh and join the conversation for jim working his magic behind the switcher i'm bob demarco saying until next time don't take dull for an answer Thanks for listening to the Knife Junkie Podcast. If you enjoyed the show, please rate and review at reviewthepodcast.com. For show notes for today's episode, additional resources, and to listen to past episodes, visit our website, theknifejunkie.com. You can also watch our latest videos on YouTube at theknifejunkie.com slash YouTube. Check out some great knife photos on theknifejunkie.com slash Instagram, and join our Facebook group at theknifejunkie.com slash Facebook. And if you have a question or comment, email them to Bob 
Bob at TheKnifeJunkie.com or call our 24-7 listener line at 724-466-4487 and you may hear your comment or question answered on an upcoming episode of The Knife Junkie Podcast. 